Good morning. Good morning, this is Victoria Beal at the Ohio LTAP Center and I have with me Ray Brushart, who is my colleague and will be your presenter for today. This is the third part in our forward series and it's focusing on reducing rural roadway departures is what the forward acronym stands for. I have a number of people who are Johnny on the spot this morning. They have already said hello or good morning in the question box and I appreciate that. We've got call outs from Michigan, from Champaign County, um, folks from all over. So it is great to have you on this webinar. And for those of you who might not have joined the last two sessions, if you wouldn't mind, um, our question box is where we're actually going to take questions from the audience today. And we'd like for you to find that box and just drop us a higher hello in there so we know that you found it and that you know where it's at. Um, so with that, the other thing I want to mention is I've had some technical issues this morning with my computer, so I was not able to get the handouts uploaded. If I'm able to during the presentation today, I will get those still uploaded. If not, I will follow up as soon as I can after this ends with a link to the handouts that Ray is going to be covering today in the webinar. So. Please put your questions in the question box throughout the presentation. I will do my best to get those over to Ray for an answer while he's um, presenting, but I know he also has a tremendous amount of information to still get through because we have a surprise for you on the fourth session. We're going to be having a guest appearance by one of our district safety review engineers who is going to be talking about how they've actually already used some of these measures to um, push down the crashes and the on Ohio's rural roads. And I know that Ray wants to get through information today so we can get that um, guest appearance in on the webinar next Thursday. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking. Ray, are you ready? Yes, I am. All yours. All right. Good morning, class. How is everybody today? Oh, that's good. Glad to hear you're all doing great. So, um, on Tuesday, we left off here in uh, part three of this, or session three in this webinar. There's six sessions. Got about halfway through. This one is called Roadway Friction Treatments and how okay, we can I, use. I got to yes. stop you real quick a minute. Okay. You said sessions, and I don't want to confuse anybody. When Ray okay. mentions sessions, he's talking about chap chapters in yeah, the course. Chapter. Yes. So we're not talking about two extra <laughs> sessions like webinars you have to attend. All right, um, there's six total sessions, or no, sex. six chapters, four there you sessions. Go. All right, there we go. We don't want confusion, I agree. Okay, so just to refresh everyone's memory, some of the things we went over uh, with um, with our friction was, uh, if we went back to like this this slide here where we talked about how each roadway has some uh, friction capability and then how you know when a crash happens it's because they they needed they demanded more friction than what was available so there's friction demand of the vehicle and on this graph where they intersect that's where the that is the point of impending skid and uh, I gave you this um, document over here on the left of the screen for your own um, research and just to have in your library is this uh, NCHRP web only document called Guide for Pavement Friction. It's free to download and it contains information from a, a much more expensive document. So it's a very good document to have. We went over the different types of treatments that are available to restore or add friction, like your thin hot mix asphalt overlay or slurry seal or microsurfacing is very popular here in Ohio. Of course, our township roads do a lot of chip and seal that uh, adds friction. And then diamond grinding, I said we saw a lot of that on our uh, interstate interchanges and that keeps our the 18 wheelers from going into a skid and then uh, 
flopping over on their sides after they go into the skid so that would prevent the skid from happening and then grooving treatments and then the one that we want to focus on in this uh, chapter is the high friction surface treatment so it is um, it has the very best results especially on our two-lane rural roads and uh, in the curves and also um, at intersections as well to help with deceleration okay so then we went over you know what exactly is a high friction surface treatment and it's, uh, went over the the polymer resin binder and the special type of aggregate and that is the calcine bauxite and um, it's not a native aggregate to Ohio you know with the they, they are uh, they do quarry it in Alabama and Arkansas and um, it used to be very expensive because a lot of it used to come from overseas but now we have it here in the US so the prices have dropped so we want to just have more projects with this bauxite because um, it it really does have more friction and then it lasts longer than the aggregate that we normally have here in Ohio, like uh, limestone and stuff like that, which only keeps its uh, higher friction, like 0 0.4, 0 0.45, or something like that for a few years, and then it starts to lose its friction value. So this, this is a higher friction value, and it maintains it for a good seven or eight, even nine years. So uh, and I had some pictures here of how it is uh, implemented by putting the resin down first and then the couple different ways to uh, embed the aggregate either by the old-fashioned way shoveling it through there or you know having a, a, a truck that rolls across and and evenly dispenses the aggregate on top of it I saw this video where both cars are going the same speed and they're slamming on the brakes at the same point and it showed uh, how the car that's on the box site comes to a stop much uh, earlier than the than the other car so it shows uh, deceleration benefits there as well but also side friction in the curves and so we went over different places of where we can benefit from this uh, added friction and uh, of course you know, we're, we're focusing on horizontal curves in our class and uh, that's definitely one of the main areas but also approaches to intersections and downhill grades and then uh, this chart was developed uh, through a research study through the Texas A&M University and shows like how far ahead of the point of curvature um, that you would begin the application in the course of you have a 55 mile per hour roadway and like if you have a curve that has a 35 mile per hour advisory speed then you'd want to have it close to 200 feet before the point of curvature to begin it and then all the way through the curve showed you a, a video there of this uh, particular intersection and how the addition of friction uh, drastically reduced the number of crashes it had a curve and an intersection and I think we got to about this point here where we um, showed this uh, research study conducted by in Florida by the Florida Department of Transportation and the results there going over the um, very good r results of lowering the crashes by you know like 50 percent or something like that and that's pretty common a 50 percent drop in crashes and that's usually a conservative um, numbers on that you know probably much even even higher than that so if you remember at the beginning of this chapter we sh we had a, a knowledge pretest, and i showed this uh, particular curve where they installed other countermeasures to help reduce the crashes there 
And if you look at that lower left picture, you see they doubled up the advance warning signs. In my opinion, those advance warning signs are too close to the curve. It should have been even earlier. But then they also doubled up, they stacked the chevrons, and then they put uh, rumble strips on the center, yellow lines. And, um, you know, they were pulling their hair out saying, well, we've done everything we can, but the crash has still happened. I guess we're going to have to have this um, at least a $500,000 or more curve realignment project to solve this problem. But before they did that, they thought that they would try the high friction surface treatment. And so when they did that, and then they studied afterwards, uh, you know, in the before the application, 2006 to 2009, they had 30 crashes that involved the wet surface. Then they installed the high friction surface treatment in 2012. And then uh, by mid-2015, there have been no reported crashes since the HFST installation. So I guess you can't get any better than that, going from uh, 30 wet crashes to zero reported crashes. So pretty drastic improvement there, just to, to show you the kind of results that you can get from this uh, high friction surface treatment with the the aggregate being the calcine bauxite. And so here's some more results of um, another study. It's uh, called a low cost pool fund study on high friction surface treatments. Uh, they looked at complex locations such as highway ramps and also curves with intersections. Um, what it says, it says, may not reduce crashes as significantly as a simple curve, since those locations have other causes besides a shortage of friction. And then uh, a recent Federal Highway Administration research study completed under the evaluation of low-cost safety improvements, pooled fund study evaluated the safety performance of high friction surface treatments on various curves and ramps in eight different states. And then the as a result of those studies, they revealed crash modification factors of 0.65 and 0.76 for ramps and curves, respectively for total crashes, and 0.14 to 0.48 for wet road crashes on ramps and curves, respectively. And um, furthermore, based on these results and very conservative estimates of high friction surface treatment, Service life and installation cost benefit ratios of approximately 4.0 to 11.9 were computed. And so there's uh, some, those are very good numbers. And um, you're looking at uh, the reasons behind using this as a countermeasure. And uh, there's another document for you. Um, I don't know if, Victoria, did you get the handouts loaded or are you still having problems with that? But I'm still Everyone on the problem with that, Ray, okay. but I can send out extra items when I send out the handouts if we need to. Okay, so when I reference studies, I always have the I have the document right there on the slide, so you can download those or view them uh, on your own time there. So that's the FHWA Evaluation of Pavement Safety Performance. It has the research study that uh, I was referencing there. And then uh, for even more information, you can uh, go to the web page from on the FHWA Office of Safety under Roadway Department. They have a pavement friction website there. And so the photos you see there are from the FHWA website. So you'll see them there. Okay, so that's really all I have um, on this chapter, but uh, you know, just can't uh, emphasize enough that uh, Federal Highway Administration really wants us to push the use of this friction treatment uh, on the curves on our two-lane roadways and to uh, do your best to 
see if you can get the box site instead of just doing the microservicing or something like that because it's supposed to be more readily available today than it used to be a few years ago. Okay, so let's uh, do some a learning outcomes review here. You can uh, put your answers into the, the question box. So the question is, how can high friction demand locations be identified? Okay, we've got crash data, locations with several wet road crashes, skid marks, curves where me other measures haven't worked, um, crash data, skid tests, um, wet crashes, curves, curves, um, intersections, crash data by traffic studies, and crash report data, review of crash histories and curves, and downgrades, um, select crash data. Those are all pretty good. Let's see what I have here. Polished pavement. So polished pavement, that means that the aggregate has become rounded, so it's it's lost its friction value. Of course, our curves, wet weather crashes. You know, we talked about lack of adequate super elevation, a lot of our county and township roads and some of our low volume state routes, two lane state routes in rural areas. They, really don't have any super elevation. In fact, some of our curves have the super elevation going the wrong way. I mean, you're, they're kind of the, the road's kind of has negative super elevation, kind of, which kind of tends to throw the car off the roadway. So um, got to watch for those areas. Intersections. And of course, our at ODOT, we have our specialized vehicles with a a trailer that can test the skid uh, resistance numbers on roadways, and uh, you know sometimes we have low skid numbers. You can determine those areas that way. So those are some of the, the ways that we do that. Here's another question: it says name the unique components of the high friction surface treatment countermeasure. So what components are used in a high friction surface treatment? Bauxite. That's one that's in there so far. Bauxite, calcinated bauxite. And what Durable else? Durable aggregate, special aggregate. They're typing, Ray. Give them a second. Two part right, epoxy. I'm, them. I'm a patient man. That's amazing. Their audio is breaking up. I'm sorry. Binder. Epoxy and bauxite. Epoxy, bauxite. All right, that's good. Um, Dave, no, as far as we know right now, Dave, it's just you on the audio. Sorry, no one else said that. But I do want to mention that I know we had storms roll through here last night and lost power. And um, I had to reset my Wi-Fi this morning here in the house in order to get things to work right. So anyway, somebody else said thin coat asphalt overlay. Chip and seal, binder. There you go, Ray. Okay, I was looking for for the high friction surface treatment. I was looking for the calcine bauxite and then the polymer resin binder. This has a higher friction uh, value than the microsurfacing and hot mix asphalt overlays and chip and seal and things like that. And it lasts longer. Okay, so um, let's get technical. How about what are the crash reduction factors for high friction surface treatment installed on curves? Point four eight, point five two, point seven four. <laughs> These are all very good. Very good guesses. I think that's probably right. Let's see what we got here. So for Point wet crashes, again, these are, these, these are conservative. So, you know, it can be even higher than this. So the, the wet crashes, 
can be you can expect a 52 percent reduction total crash is 24 percent but you know we saw we saw an, an instance where it reduced all curves to zero so all crashes to zero what i meant to say okay so let's do a knowledge post test here we have a curve looks like a two-lane rural road so what issues do we see in this photo? Poor super elevation, cross on tree, lack of super elevation, no signs, tree in clear zone, lack of proper super elevation, no signage, cross mounted on tree, which equals a death, no warning signs, no chevrons, no advanced curve, no retroreflective delineation, there's fixed objects, roadside slope, no signs, lack of super elevation, trees, right. worn good. pavement, clear zone issues, lack of shoulder. Very good. All right. All right. But uh, okay, so in this photo, we see there's a cross on the tree that usually indicates that a um, fatal crash probably happened there. Would the would removal of the tree solve the problem? And is it possible to remove the tree? The fence is likely the edge of the right way. So you see a fence here that the property put in there. That's definitely not a. I don't. Doesn't look like government money was that fence, does it? Um. A barrier could be used at this location as there are multiple trees. Is this roadway super elevated? It doesn't look like it, does it? How can the lack of super elevation be mitigated? You probably do a high friction surface treatment, right? So high friction surface treatment can reduce the risk of departure, especially super elevation. So, uh, her answers our previous chap. We don't have Chevron or like that either. And we'll talk barriers. Um, chapters forthcoming. Okay, so that's uh, all I have for chapter three. Let's move on to our chapter four here. Okay, so in cha chapter four, we're talking about another countermeasure that focuses on keeping the vehicles on the roadway. So here's a picture of some center line rumbles, and then we have the shoulder rumbles in the right picture. So the learning outcomes from this chapter will be that you'll be able to do a rumble strip, rumble stripe, and you'll be able to describe and installation strips and stripes and you'll recognize the crash reduction potential for rumble strips and stripes. Let's do a knowledge pretest. So I'm gonna show you a video. I'll make sure that my volume is cranked up. Let me make sure from this side too. All right, let's listen and watch this video, then we'll talk about it afterwards. I replayed that night over and over and over again. I thought, I'm just so close to home. I can make it. That night, Rusty Burris was 18 years old with a bright future. But driving home from his girlfriend's house, his life changed forever. I knew I was tired, but I didn't really feel that I was that tired. 
and driving home, I got just a mile from home and fell asleep with the wheel. In seconds, Rusty's car drifted off this country road and rolled over. The impact crushed his roof and his spine. Rusty would never walk again. I've fallen asleep and crashed my car one time. And that's all it took. Experts say every day, millions of teens are dangerously tired when they get behind the wheel. More than a third of teens, they drive drowsy on a regular basis. And more than half related crashes involve drivers under 25. Okay. Let me turn this back down here. Okay, so what was the concern in the video? As, dri as dri drivers are falling asleep at the wheel, what countermeasure to address this concern? The answer to that is going to be rumble strips or rumble strips. That, um, you know, the, the hope is that when you hit the rumbles, it uh, wakes you up out of your drowsy state and helps you refocus on the roadway before you get any trouble by drifting out of your lane or off the road. But some other um, types of crashes or causal factors addressed by rumbles are um, distracted drivers or inattentive drivers. And uh, I think we all know that uh, we could use a countermeasure that uh, helps us distracted driving or in, inattentive drivers in this day and age. So this has become our, our number one weapon against distracted and inattentive drivers. And uh, as far as the roadway departure crashes, it helps with run off the road crashes and head on crashes. And this is a, the report that I've talked about several times throughout this webinar and it's NCHRP report 500 which has at least 18 volumes to it, but each one of these volumes uh, has a different focus area. So volume six here in the middle is a guide for addressing run off the road collisions. The one on the far right is volume four, a guide for addressing head on collisions. And on the far left here, we have a guide for reducing crashes involving drowsy and distracted drivers. And so they talk about rumbles in all three of these reports. And you can download these. Uh, they're at the, uh, the link at the bottom, the trb.org. And it gives you the, um, the area there. That, and you'll have this in your handout. So we have different methods of producing rumbles. One is a the rolled-in treatment that's a... Uh, can do that while you have a fresh overlay. And uh, the rolled rumbles, they are not uh, used much anymore as they, um, they have to be done at the time of paving and they, they really don't produce as much noise or vibration as the milled in rumbles. So the milled in rumbles, uh, we prefer those uh, because they just have a better result. And then we also have thermoplastic markers that can be applied to create a profile marking, which also produces a rumble effect and enhances visibility of the marking. A few agencies have used this treatment with good results, but there has been no evaluation comparing raised rumbles to milled. In addition, in snow zones, raised markings will require more maintenance. So of all these, we prefer the milled in rumbles. And um, another reference material here, you could uh, you could read uh, put in Google NCHRP report 641. And on page 117, there, there is a study of the effectiveness of various rumble strips on highway safety. And uh, you can read about that in that booklet. 
And then here's some more resources. Ray, quick question for you. Yes. Uh huh. Can you hear me, okay. Ray? Quick question for you. Yes. Can um, you hear is, me? Do you have any idea of? Yeah, I can. Any idea of research on okay. the impacts, meaning driver comfort, of the different rumble types in Ohio? Yeah, we're going to uh, we'll talk about that, and as far as noise levels too, because that's another thing you hear. Um, Great. Especially if you you have um, public meetings and stuff, you're telling them you put them in. A lot of times we get, you know, we've had to deal with uh, a lot of uh, feedback, negative feedback, saying they don't want to hear the noise all the time and things like that. So I'll get I'll get there in here in a little bit. So here's some more resources that you can download about this. So we've got <clears throat> these have been last updated in, in 2011, but there's a from Federal Highway and U.S. Department of Transportation, the technical advisories on uh, shoulder and edge line rumble strips and also center line rumble strips. And then on the far right, we have our, uh, from the FHWA safety program, the document called Decision Support Guide for the Installation of Shoulder and Centerline Rumble Strips on Non-Freeways. And so that's uh, a more of a focus there on, on the roadway that we're talking about in this uh, webinar, which is our two-lane rural roads. So here's some of the dimensions of our rumble, milled rumble strips. So these are drawings based on NCHRP report 641, but they've been modified for the FHWA technical advisory 5040.39. And um, we have some uh, information from the Missouri Department of Transportation. They reported that the the milled shoulder rumble strips can result in 12 and a half times higher vibration stimuli and 3.3 times higher auditory stimuli than rolled rumble strips. And then uh, a study of effectiveness of various rumble strips on highway safety back in 1994 even uh, from from the Virginia Department of Transportation, they said for sound level tests under 65 miles per hour, the milled rumble strip sound excess level is 335% or 3.35 times more noise and 12.6 times more vibration excesses than for rolled rumble strips. So you, know, you get more vibration through the milled rather than the rolled and that's what what we're shooting for in order to um, get the driver out of their inattentive state or drowsy state and so they have some drawings here um, you've probably seen this on the shoulder rumbles they have these gaps in between that's actually for bicyclists so uh, every every sort of distance, they'll have this uh, area that has, does not have rumbles. And that way, you know, bicyclists have been studied or interviewed a lot of times. And when, they're, when there is a paved shoulder for them to ride on, a lot of times they don't like it because that's where a lot of uh, gravel and broken glass and things like that are. So they prefer to be in the lane, uh, but um, you know, they don't like to drive over the rumbles when they go in and on the shoulder, back and forth between in the lane and on the shoulder. So that's how, so they like that. So then we have, um, it says here that the, the typical rumbles are 12 inches to 16 inches long on shoulders and eight inches to 12 inches long on edge lines. Some installations of narrower rumbles have, have been tried, but these will produce less noise and vibration. And 
And then this thing here on the far right on the bottom is called a mumble, a mumble strip, which is being uh, researched. And uh, so it's where the pavement surface is continuously ground down for a sinusoidal pattern. And we'll discuss uh, mumbles later in this session. So you said we have somebody from Michigan here in class today. So let's see what Michigan has done for us in the rumbles department. So they've done some studies and they, they show that when the road is wet, like when it's raining, it has a benefit uh, for the for the stripe, when you when you paint the white edge line over the rumble, and it's retro reflective, it really helps. Uh, the, the edge line does not disappear as it does a lot of times when it's wet. So it's like that wall in the on the on the side of the rumble. It actually, you know, it's coated with the retro reflective paint and uh, it shows up even when it's wet. And um, so that provides a really good benefit. So then here's uh, the guidance that I talked about a couple slides ago, NCHRP report 641. Guidance for the, the design and application of shoulder and centerline rumble strips. And the studies have shown that on rural rural freeways, they had a 10% reduction in our, let me see here. The uh, SVROR, ROR is run off the road, 10% reduction in those crashes and a 17% reduction in the, the run off the road fatal or injury crashes. And that's also found in the CMF clearinghouse. And then on our rural two lane roads, they had an even higher reduction in the those run off the road crashes and then an even higher um, reduction in the run off the road fatal and injury crashes, a 36% reduction. So those are those are the results of you know real research. And so you can expect even higher than that. Uh, so those are very conservative numbers. And so they're pretty effective in reducing uh, the run off the road type of crashes. And we have different places that you can, different ways to place the centerline rumble strips and stripes. Here in the top left, we're looking at centerline rumble strips that are milled across the joint. Then you then stripe over the rumble. And uh, if there are concerns for the joint or desire for more separation, the rumbles can be installed on each side of the center line as you see on the far right. Some states use a variation with leaving out every third rumble. This may produce a different sound and may be less aggressive. However, since it's usually the driver, it isn't expected that this will have much effect on performance. Because if it's on the center line, it's the driver that's gonna feel the jolt a little bit more than the passenger. I guess that wouldn't be the case in England now, would it? So there's the, the picture in the middle has the centerline rumble stripes with variable spacing. Couple questions that came in, Ray, real quick. Okay, all right. <laughs> Excuse me. Would each side of the centerline um, require wider lanes? And does the application of paint need increased for centerline rumble stripes? Yeah, that's something to think about. Um, you know, if you already have a really narrow road, you know, people aren't, aren't going to want to drive on the rumble all the whole way, all the whole way down the road. So, 
Um, you know, this is probably on a, when you have the treatment on the far right, that's probably where you'd have at least a 10 foot lane or maybe even 10 and a half. So if you have a, a typical township road with a 16 foot of pavement, you, you wouldn't want to do that. What was another question? Has there been any studies on the pavement life with rumble stripes and any chance for additional ice developing in the rumble stripes? Yeah, they've done quite a bit of studies uh, when we're talking about the center line rumbles and they even came up with a, a standard drawing um, as far as like a, like a new method of uh, when you when you're putting the asphalt down, how they sort of do an interlocking method uh, with the paver instead of just having the two sides meet. And um, so they, I'll, I'll get to there. It is. It's coming up in another slide. So we'll show that when I get there. Okay, so again, some more information from the NCH report 641 about how um, the effect on two lane rural roads with the with center line rumble strips um, has a, a, a slight reduction in total crashes, 9% reduction in fatal injury crashes. 37% reduction in total target crashes. So that's, you know, the head on collisions. And 45% reduction in fatal or injury target crashes. So target crashes are the head on and opposite direction side swipe. So those are the uh, crashes that, uh, we, that you're focusing on when you do this treatment. And again, there's, um, the link at the bottom for more information on that specific information. So let's take a look at some more rumble strip or stripe considerations. We have, uh, as one of our questions already asked, is the pavement concerns and then noise and vibration and then concern, considerations for bicyclists and operational effects. So let's, let's take a look at, uh, you know, if you're going to, have a public meeting about the installation of rumbles, you have to be prepared to answer uh, these concerns. So the concern for joint deterioration with rumbles, so as you see in the picture there, looks like the, the joint is kind of deteriorating there. So they have developed some techniques to improve the joints. Uh, there's a wedge joint, which is shown in the picture there to bot in the bottom center. See how they sort of interlock and they have a, a 12 to 1 taper and it shows where the roller wheel uh, would go. And um, it says make the first pass straight, properly compact the joint, mill out along the existing joints. So there is some um, some guidance for how to um, when you when you do your resurfacing. That's when you need to um, follow these guidelines so in order to be able to mill in the rumbles along the center line, so you don't have that um, joint deterioration. And then we also have some more help from uh, Michigan. They have a rumble over a chip seal. Let's um, see what else I have on that. So routes that are chip sealed, and a lot of our county and township roads are chip sealed. Um, so there, there's a concern there. So Michigan has milled in rumbles on chip sealed routes and the state of Washington has chip sealed over the rumbles. 
And in those cases, you may want to have deeper rumbles to accommodate the future chips, future applications of chip and seal. Rumbles are still visible and they make noise, though no studies have been conducted on how these compare to new rumbles. But uh, just the fact you can see them, you're going to get some benefit there. So maybe uh, maybe that's something we can find on the Michigan DOT's website. But uh, maybe the person in our class can let us know about that. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at some rumble strip noise factors, internal and external. So internal is inside your car, external is what the the houses, the residents along the road are going to hear. And uh, these noise levels are affected by the depth of the rumble, the width, the length, the spacing, and vehicle speed. And uh, this is all talked about in that NCH RP report 641. And so variations in any of these factors will affect the noise heard outside a vehicle, along with the noise heard and vibrations felt inside a vehicle. So how to address rumble strip noise issues. So like I said, this would uh, come up in our public meetings where we're, you know, we're offering this on a roadway to, and we try to get a feel from the residents. Um, so to discontinue or interrupt rumbles, um, so intersections, driveways, and turn lanes, or areas there to, you can interrupt the rumbles or discontinue them like you, like you see in this picture on the right. Um, structures, you know, your bridges, catch basins, drainage grates, areas with limited lateral clearance or where off tracking could occur. And prior to residential areas to mitigate complaints. So you can, you can discontinue, we continue the rumbles through the rural areas and then when you get to where some houses are maybe you could uh, discontinue them there in that section or we can adjust the rumble dimensions you can adjust the depth of the rumbles spacing width etc and that would produce less external noise and then another way to do that as they're doing in california and minnesota they're evaluating these devices, which are called mumble strips, and um, so these, the preliminary results show a reduction in external noise, but they're still being studied, so they have yet to determine the safety benefits. So there's a, a picture of the mumble strip in the top left. And then uh, the other information there is uh, you know, complaints from residents that live near installations of rumbles is not uncommon. In most cases, it isn't that the rumbles are resulting in a higher noise level, but that they are a different pitch. And then from the report 641 for shoulder rumble strips, it says consideration should be given to terminating the rumble strips about 650 feet prior to residential or urban areas. This threshold value is based on studies that showed noise impacts from this distance proved tolerable to nearby residents. And then uh, the state of Oregon, <clears throat> their DOT has produced an uh, engineering technical document, some guidance that has uh, further rumble strip use guidance documents. Okay, let's talk about rumble strips and bicycles. So as I said before, the bicyclists really prefer to be in the lane itself, the travel lane. But then our, um, our technical guidance from FHWA um, 
says that the rumble strips, four feet beyond the rumble strips, the edge of pavement is preferred. And so, of course, in these areas here, like the bottom right picture, there's a nice, healthy, wide shoulder, so they can accommodate that. That's a pretty good deal if you, you have that sort of uh, shoulder on your roadway. And uh, it also says to use edge line rumble strips or smaller offset in a shoulder area. And it include these gaps that are 10 to 12 feet every 40 to 60 feet. So again, that's to let the bicyclists go in and out. They can stay on, in the lane when there's no traffic coming. And then if they need to get over, they have a gap to get over. So where shoulders are available and clear, you know, there's not a lot of gravel and broken glass, bicyclists will often choose to use them to avoid conflicts with faster moving vehicles in the travel lane. However, as legal road users, they may also be in the travel lane. There are a number of measures that should be considered to accommodate bicyclists. Now, some bicyclists have noted that they like rumbles as it gives them warning if a vehicle is coming up from behind them. So yeah, you know, as a, a, a car might hit the rumbles as they approach from behind and the, and the bicyclists will hear them. Since installing shoulder or edge line rumbles can affect, can, can affect the available width beyond the edge line for bicyclists, there are some options a road agency can explore to better accommodate bicyclists. So that's what I, these three bullet points are up here at the top. You can also adjust rumble dimensions, again, depth, length, width, and spacing. And some agencies use shallower rumbles as an acceptable compromise. So let's take a look at some operational effects of rumble strips on two lane undivided roads. That seems to be up our alley here. So for our center line rumble strips, it says no adverse impacts on lanes greater than or equal to 10 feet. So I think that answers somebody's question from earlier. Helps the center when you have them on your center line, it helps the center of the vehicle in the lane when the shoulders are one to two feet wide. And for our center line rumble strips and edge line rumble strips, it showed no adverse impacts on lanes greater than or equal to 11 feet. So of course that's a very wide lane, probably a state route at that point. Helps the center vehicle in the lane when shoulders are three feet wide. So if you have the rumbles on the edge line and the center line, <clears throat> it has an effect that it, it helps the vehicles to stay centered in their lane. Okay, so there is a... a FHWA website about rumble strips and stripes for more information on there. And so it's got uh, different categories of their information on that site from general information to safety, going over the, the crash reduction statistics, uh, design and construction inf information, accommodating all users, mitigating noise, pavement and maintenance, policies, guidance, and research, and frequently asked questions. So this is a, a very good website for uh, everybody to have in their back pocket as far as, because uh, you're going to get questions in all these areas when you propose rumble strips on your roadways. So it's good to know that this website exists and it's got some very good information on all these areas. Okay, so let's do a, uh, a learning outcome review for this chapter. It says, uh, describe a rumble strip or stripes. What are the characteristics of a milled rumble stripe? 
Hey, Ray, while people are putting their answers in there, our friend from Michigan wants us all to know that he's a Michigan resident, but he's an Ohio engineer. Aha. Uh -huh. so. All right, I know Got people it. are typing. Go ahead and put your responses up. Question. Noise. Very, very technical question here. Yeah. See, noise, relection, width, length, depth. Okay. Sound, reflection, reflection of markings, milled or rolled pattern to alert drivers, milled pavement, curved into pavement with length, width, depth. Better noise, vibration, depressions in road, adjacent to traveled way, with length, depth, sound. Okay, there you go. All right, very good. But as far as the dimensions, I wanted to, it could be a half inch to five eighths of an inch deep, uh, seven inches longitudinally. On the shoulder, they could be 12 to 16 inch laterally. And on the edge line, eight to 12 inches laterally. And you can make a rumble stripe by installing pavement markings over a rumble for improved visibility on dark rainy nights. So yeah, they definitely, definitely help in the dark rainy nights. Okay, another question here. What should be considered when installing rumbles? Pavement width. Right. Noise. Noise presence of bicycles. Excessive noise in residential areas with a roadway residences nearby. Shoulder width, shoulder width, residential area, shoulder width, lane width, with a road, proximity to noise sensitive land user, uses, Very pattern good. of driver, unfocused, long straight areas. You know, I forgot to talk about one of the benefits of oh, wait line rumbles. Another one just came in that I got to add in here Amish All buggy. Right. wonder what they mean. I'm sure they're talking about the buggies driving over the rumble strips or stripes too. They, they probably wouldn't like that. Is that what you're saying? Probably. I would guess. Okay, so um, another benefit of the, the edge line rumbles is that the snow plow driver, when there's a heavy snow, they know where the edge of the, the pavement is. I've heard that from several uh, snow plow drivers. Okay, but what do we? What should we consider when installing these? We have to see: is that roadway does it have a have some bicycles on there? Uh, noise levels: is it uh, is it a residential or a more urban area? And we might want to look at noise reduction factors. Uh, are there intersections in places where we want to? You know, we would uh, disrupt or discontinue the rumbles as we approach those areas. The type of rumble we want to use, whether it be milled, raised, or a mumble, the width of the lane is very important, and the proximity to the edge line. So those are all considerations. And then uh, what are the crash reduction factors for edge line and center line rumble strips on two lane rural roads? Point four eight. That's what came in yeah, so far. Yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty good stab at it. Yeah. Rumbles. Oh, another comment on the buggy thing. Um, okay. Rumbles with buggies is addressed in a recently completed Amish study. The project management, the project manager was Jared Feller from District Three. I'll pull that study down and send it out to everybody who's on this webinar to make sure you, you've got it. Um, let's see, 16 and 36 percent, 0.52, 0 0.52. All pretty good, but if we if we check out our uh, trading cards, 
that goes along with this class. We would see that uh, there's a 36 for the edge and shoulder rumbles for the two lane rural roads. There's a 36% reduction in fatal and injury crashes. And for the center line rumbles on two lane rural roads, it could have a crash reduction factor of 45% on fatal and injury crashes. So uh, you can actually order these trading cards um, to pass out. Okay, a knowledge post test. So what are some of the issues we discussed that are shown in these photos? I haven't got any comments yet, but I'm sure they're just typing. Pavement joint deterioration, pavement markings, rumble strips, joint degradation, possible center line joint degradation, deterioration. Rumbles look narrow, joint issues with rumbles, rain, joint, pavement marking signage, deterioration of joints, gaps exist for bicycles. That's good. Joints. Very good. Very good. Rumble strip joints, too narrow. Let's see what we have here. Whoops. I don't have bullet points. I'll just read them. We got uh, the rumble stripes improve visibility at night, especially on rainy nights. Narrower edge line rumbles reduce impact to bicyclists. We have bicycle gaps here in the left picture. There's a gap. Center line and edge line rumbles together where there are 11 foot lanes. So if you have 11 foot lanes, you can do both edge line and center line. Uh, we have a different center line pattern. You can look at different patterns for the center line rumbles. And rumbles may help if the road is covered in ice. Let's see the second photo. Hmm. That went too far. Okay. So those pictures come from our from North Dakota. Does it look like North Dakota there? All right, so that's all I have for our, for the rumbles. That's chapter four. And of course, I gave you a lot of reference sources um, for that chapter. So let's move on to our chapter five. Okay, so we've um, we've gone over all of the countermeasures that help us keep the vehicles on the road. So we've we've done all we could, and so now, even with all those, the vehicle has left their lane of travel. So now we want to install some countermeasures that will reduce the potential for a crash if the vehicle leaves the roadway. So we want to do our best to help them recover and get back in their lane with these treatments. So here in this picture, we see a couple of these that we're going to discuss today. So what, what do we see here in this picture? I'll just tell you so we can move along. <laughs> we have a page. Oh, there's a couple of things. I'll read it off. Icing buildup in base of rumble remove or adequately mark roadside obstacle traversable ditch. Right. Very good. So we have a force slope and back slopes adequate. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll stop. Thanks. Right. So we have a paved shoulder and then we have traversable slopes in the in the clear zone here. Very good. Okay, so our learning outcomes for this chapter is going to be that you will be able to identify countermeasures that can reduce the potential for a crash if a vehicle leaves the roadway, and you will be able to define the clear zone. So let's do a knowledge pretest. And so we look at the picture and you uh, Tell me what road elements do you see that might contribute to a crash if the driver leaves the roadway?
That looks like a pretty scary road to drive on, doesn't it? They're just rolling in, Ray. All deep right. ditch slope, deep ditch with no guardrail, like a guardrail which appears warranted, no clear zone, close to ditch, no barrier, shoulder slope, rumble stripes, alligator in ditch, missing guardrail, <laughs> no berm, abrupt edge, water hazard, no shoulder, steep in slope, vehicle overturn when leaving the roadway, no berm, hazard of deep ditch, steep slope. There Very you go. good. That's enough. Okay, so. Yeah, we have, uh, there's no shoulders on the road. Once you leave your, if you're heading towards uh, towards us in the picture, you're, if you go off to the right side of the road, you don't have much, uh, there's no room for error, basically. And then you have your steep slope, and then we've got water at the bottom of the slope. So, big trouble there. So we need to, what can we do to improve these areas? Okay, so here's a reminder of our our three objectives in this webinar series. First, keep vehicles on the road. Second, reduce the potential for crashes and provide areas for them to recover. And then we've done all we can to prevent the crash, but the crash happens anyway. We want to have some countermeasures that minimize the severity of those crash crashes. So. Um, in this session, we're going to discuss treatments that can help a driver recover, control their vehicle, and avoid a crash if they do leave the road. So we're going to be talking about the shoulders of the roadway, a treatment called the safety edge, a centerline buffer, a clear zone, and traversable slopes. Okay, so let's first talk about our shoulder widening treatment. You can see in this picture that they uh, had a shoulder widening project there. And uh, so motorists rely on shoulders to recover. It's especially critical to have a shoulder where we have horizontal curves. So the presence of shoulders, whether they be paved or unpaved, can have a major impact on the ability of a driver to regain control if they leave the traveled way. While it may not always be practical to widen the highway to provide shoulders, consideration of widening at critical locations such as curves, where roadway departures are more probable, might be appropriate. And so, the Highway Safety Manual has taken a look at adding shoulders along a roadway, and they've even studied different widths of the shoulders. And so you get a uh, the high the, the the wider the shoulder, the more uh, potential you have to reduce uh, the crashes. And so they've gone from a, a, a the addition of a two foot shoulder. And they looked at four foot shoulder, six foot shoulder, and eight foot shoulders with different average annual daily traffic. And uh, each one of those had a different crash reduction factor. So that drawing shows the relationship uh, of the crash reduction between, the, between crash reduction and shoulder width. And so the highway safety manual, they always have a baseline that they judge these on or base these on. So a six foot wide shoulder is the baseline. So let's uh, take a look at what uh, our friends in Alabama have, uh, have done with their shoulder widening program. Okay, so in Alabama, let's see the, the before and after picture here. So they have no paved shoulder on this side of the road. And then they added about a two foot shoulder and put rumbles on it. So they added a two foot 
shoulder up to a four foot shoulder on two lane or four lane rural roads. So the picture shows a two foot wide shoulder. And so they studied this over a period of five years where they had projects uh, representing about 700 road miles of adding shoulders only or shoulders with rumbles or shoulders with rumble stripes. And additionally, because the benefit cost ratio for two lane rural roads, adding a shoulder only was a, a 53 to one benefit cost ratio. This would likely be much higher if widening only in curves. So they produced a, a study and it's uh, documented. It's called a study of the effects of pavement widening rumble strips and rumble stripes on rural highways in Alabama. And you can go, um, it's called the Al, ALDOT 930-827 report. And so anyway, they, they studied all this with five years of data and they came up with uh, for two lane rural roads, crash modification factors of 0 0.79, 0 0.82 and 0.72 or the combined effect of paved shoulder and shoulder rumble stripes, the combined effect of paved shoulder and shoulder or strips and then shoulder rumble stripes and paved shoulder only respectively. And so they had uh, on two lane roads, the benefit cost ratios in those areas were 42 to one, 33 to one and 53 to one. And so pretty big, benefit cost ratios in this area. So that's something that we, you know, we hope that uh, more agencies will consider these uh, shoulder widening projects to go along with their resurfacing um, programs if they can do it. So just the, just the two, just a two feet makes a big deal. So let's look at our next treatment and it's called the pavement edge drop off. So you can see there on the left, there's a, a big pavement edge drop off about six inches there. And so that creates a big problem uh, for motorists when they like when the front right tire of the vehicle drops off the edge of the pavement and uh, some bad crashes result from that because they, they tend to jerk the wheel to the left, but then nothing happens because the tire is scrubbing up against the, the wall of the pavement. So then they freak out and turn the wheel even more. And by then it, it overcomes that wall, but then when it gets up back on the road, it shoots the, the vehicle almost straight to the left because they've overcompensated and they go left of center line or even all the way off the, the left side of the roadway. So we've known about this pavement edge drop off treatment for a good 10 years now. It's been used in a lot of places in Ohio. But uh, for those that are not using it, we want you to be aware of it and that it, you can, uh, it really doesn't add much of a cost to your resurfacing program. So why not do it if it has such a, a really good benefit here? So let's look at this video. Well, that was fun to watch, wasn't it? So it just showed how a, even a driver in a test, how they, they lose control of a car if they um, experience this uh, pavement edge drop off or they first turn the wheel and nothing happens. And then they turn it again and then over, and then it shoots the car to the left um, out of control where, where they've overcompensated. Okay, so this talks more about 
how we get this done. We're uh, when you're paving, resurfacing, you can uh, you can create this 30 degree pavement edge shape, uh, and it provides stability for vehicles recovering from a roadway departure. And you can implement this as a standard practice for paving and resurfacing projects. And so we can take a look at these uh, very good crash reduction figures for different types of crashes. So reducing the drop-off type of crashes by 35%, run off the road 21%, head-on roadway departures 19%, and fatal and injury crashes by 11%. And uh, like I said, it's hardly any cost whatsoever to add this to your resurfacing project. And you can find more information on this um, in this safety effects of the safety edge document. And there's a link to it there at the bottom of the screen. So here's a picture here, which is the most recoverable and so they could have used better pictures on this because it doesn't look like like much. But the one on the left is showing the 30 degree angle. It really doesn't look 30 degrees. It looks, it looks more like 45 degrees. But then the one on the right is showing almost a, a complete straight down drop off. And so they're, it's showing the original safety edge project location eight years after construction. So the road had been constructed using the safety edge boot. The boot, they're talking about the attachment to the paver on one side of the road and standard practices on the other side. So the pictures were taken directly across the roadway from each other. The side with the safety edge shows the increased durability and the stability of the safety edge, even though the shoulder material has eroded away. And then the side without the safety edge exhibits a steeper near vertical drop off and a lot of cracking near the edge of pavement. Okay, so this picture had the treatment eight years ago. And when it was constructed, they have the filler material here that comes up, but over time that went away. And then over here, you know, we see some, some raveling of the edge and a straight drop off there. So let's take a look at um, some more statistics here. So um, opposite direction fatal crashes predominantly occur on undivided highways in rural areas with posted speeds uh, 50 miles per hour or greater. And the NCHRP Report 500, Volume 4, reported that only 4.2% of head on crashes involved a passing vehicle. So you might think that a lot of head on crashes occur on the two lane rural roads because somebody is passing somebody. Well, the, the statistics don't show that. So it's a very low percentage of that actually happens. Let's see what we got here. Let's take a look at, uh, well, let's show, talk about these other ones. So we have a, so with with this improvement, we have a, a reduction of 28, oh, wait a minute, 28% of head-on crashes happen on these uh, two-lane roads. Undivided roads, 87% of rural roadway departure head-on fatalities happen on, whoops, I keep going backwards, happen on our two lane rural roads that have greater than or equal to 55 mile per hour. Roads have 84% of the head on crashes are fatal. And 32% of crashes in the curves um, are head on fatal crashes. Let's take a look at this crash. There was no sound in that, but anyway, it shows a head-on crash going left of center. 
Ray, you have yeah. 10 minutes remaining. Okay. And so that was a uh, So what happened there was someone fell asleep at the wheel is what that was. And then they, they went left of center. We should have showed that during our the rumble strip. But um, so that's an example of a, a head on crash on a two lane road. Um, but we can reduce those those instances with even the it could have been caused just as well by a someone going off the right side of the road and experiencing the pavement edge drop off. But um, we've looked at you know some treatments that reduce the head-on collision. Of course, our rumbles. Would uh, if that guy was asleep at the wheel? Hopefully the rumbles could have prevented that. Um, but there's you know other reasons besides falling asleep at the wheel could have been a a pavement edge drop off uh, was could have been the reason for shooting left of center as well. Um, another countermeasure we have is to uh, install this center line buffer area. Of course you're going to have to have a certain width of lane. Uh, to do that. Uh, so a lot of our county and township roads probably don't have the width to do this, but it does provide a buffer area between opposing directions of traffic. So this in itself can reduce head-on crashes. So it provides some extra space between the two uh, lanes and the, between the two solid center line markings further separating opposing directions of traffic to reduce head-on uh, crashes. So then they have you know, different buffer widths down here in the bottom right uh, from uh, two feet, four feet, even 10 feet, you know, if you have those types of lane widths. And of course you have a even a two foot buffer width uh, helped uh, help to reduce the crashes by 35% for head-on crashes. So that's pretty good. Just by adding paint um, to add some width there, that's a pretty good low-cost benefit for those serious of a crash. Ray, a question okay. that came in is All right. they want to know are those intended to be for spot locations or long distances because there's a concern over the cost um, of that type of treatment of the center line buffer area yeah i mean that yes. would be if you had to widen the road then of course that would be so um be great if you had all that existing pavement as you see in the picture here we've got a bike lane and still has a shoulder beyond it and still had the room to have about a four foot buffer space here so um, yeah, it would be costly if you're going to widen the road to install that. Um, so, am I, I'm probably running out of time. Well, I still got some time here, right? We've got seven um, minutes. Okay, so that's something to consider uh, if you have the the pavement width to do that. Another thing to consider is to look at the clear zone of the of the roadway. So that's you know outside of the roadway. So the clear zone is the unobstructed traversable area provided beyond the edge of the through traveled way for the recovery of errant vehicles. So the concept of the clear zone is defined right there. That's our definition. And its importance is only for the understanding of why the countermeasures are effective in reducing rollovers, reducing crash potential or crash severity. So flattening the slopes, removal of trees in the clear zone, and adjusting um, our countermeasures, adjusting the, the, the slope of, it, of the ditches. So location of applicable countermeasures are typically in the clear zone. So this picture shows a steep 
slope um, two to one or greater on the right must be over here. Typical sections slopes are three to one or four to one or steeper. So these countermeasures all work to provide a reasonable clear zone. And over here on the right, obviously, we've got a, a tree right beside the edge of pavement. So sometimes it's difficult to remove trees like that because uh, people love their trees. So it's something to think about. We'll get about we'll get around to talking about what if we can't remove trees uh, in the final chapter of the webinar. So how much clear zone do we need? So we have this um, information from the Ashto Roadside Design Guide, uh, which is pictured there on the upper right of your screen. So the Ashto Roadside Design Guide provides guidance for the width of the clear zone. And these values are based on a couple of studies that found that about 80% of vehicles that ran off the road stopped within 30 feet of the traveled way. So 80% of vehicles that leave the road, they go off the roadway, they, they somehow stop within 30 feet of the edge of the roadway. And the values, um, different values that were factored in were speed, average daily traffic, and side slope, but are still considered to address about 80% of encroachments. And so you have your different design speeds on the far left of the table and different values of average daily traffic. And then you've got uh, the four slopes of the ditch defined and then the back slopes of the ditch. And so those are, those are design um, specifications. And so what does traversable mean? So if a slope is one to four or flatter, then yes, it is traversable. Uh, actually three to one. So roadside slopes that are three to one or flatter are considered traversable. This means that in most cases, an errant vehicle can cross over these slopes without rolling over. Slopes that are four to one or steeper are also considered recoverable. This means that the driver can actually start recovering control on the slope. Slopes steeper than three to one are considered critical and depending on their height, a barrier may be appropriate. So uh, the top picture is from Florida and the bottom picture is from the state of Washington. That's a pretty uh, scary picture there at the bottom right, isn't it? So it must be like a, a lumber uh, clearing area, it looks like. But, uh, you wouldn't want to run off that roadway, would you? Okay, so then we get into some um, talking about rollover crashes. Remember, that's one of the types of crashes we wanted to focus on. And so that's why uh, improving the clear zone is important if we're going to have an effect on reducing rollover crashes. Let me see here. Where was I? Okay. All right, Ray, you got a minute left, so pick a spot to wrap okay. up. Well, maybe uh, we can stop here as we talk about how improving the clear zone will have a, a good effect on reducing rollover crashes. We can pick up here on uh, on Tuesday, our our final session of our forward webinar. And uh, we'll, we'll finish up talking about uh, the clear zones. And we'll also get into uh, barrier treatment and uh, some other things like that. And uh, if we can't cut down trees, what else can we do? So really that sort of uh, discussions. And then we'll have our special guest, Dirk Gross, from our District 6 District Safety Review Team uh, to discuss some uh, forward type projects that have occurred in our 
in our central Ohio area. Sounds great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar for everybody. I hope you have a fabulous weekend. Stay safe, and we will see you Tuesday. Take All right, care. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.